But uh, Grant Napier might have a different thought. He will be out doing his broadcast with Doug Christie at 3 o'clock uh, later today, leading you all the way into tip-off at 7. Good morning, buddy. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing good, man. I, I got a little bit of a taste of uh, of what you guys uh, do on game days. I, I was I was out there when you started your show uh, the other night because my daughter's uh, little national yeah. anthem thing. And, and my goodness, man, that is a uh, that is a there's a lot of time when you're basically in that arena, not by yourself, but the amount of production that goes into everything before the game was pretty interesting. It's pretty amazing. I mean, uh, and we got a chance to do that in every arena pretty much uh, in the league except for on the East Coast because we're preempted because of the early start times. But, you know, each arena has their own schedule before the game. Uh, and it's it's pretty interesting to see all the work that goes in before the fans even get into the arena. It starts early. It even starts sometimes before 3 o'clock when we go on the air. Uh, but it's it's pretty much nonstop for about two hours before the players actually come out and start getting their share of workout in. And normally, you know, they, a lot of arenas like to have everything done by 4.30 for a 7 o'clock game, but sometimes it goes up to 5. But, yeah, it's pretty nonstop, isn't it? Yeah, honestly. And and you know why I was out there. Listen, uh, we've known each other a long time. I can take it. Uh, so be honest. Uh, your thoughts on the uh, national anthem that evening? I, I told you already it was great. Um, I liked it because they only rehearsed it one time. Yes. Uh, sometimes, which is perfect when I'm in the middle of doing my radio show. So that was great. Um, they were fast. They were, it was a classic rendition yes. of the national anthem with the band. Uh, there was no nonsense. Uh, it was good. Uh, it was well done. And I w- honestly, I hear them every night. I thought that was a, a great job. Yep. Absolutely great job. The mom and Avery are in the car right now listening. That's why I set you up for that. So well, she- no, it was, I'm not kidding you. They, they were really good. I was like, wow, they were really, really good. They were, uh, they were one of the best of the year, and I really mean that. I mean, we get 41 a year, and I would put them in the top five. True or false, if the Kings play tonight uh, against the Celtics the way they played against the Knicks, they're not going to win the ball game. Yeah, they got to play with more energy. They got to be more focused. Now the passing was excellent the other night. Yep. Uh, and I listen. I was thinking about this. They've been in so many incredibly tight games against upper echelon teams. I, I just think that they didn't have the the pizzazz, the swagger that they've been showing. But I expect them to have that tonight because they know full well, especially after watching them destroy the Warriors last night. They're going to need an, an A game, and the 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 part of that is if the Celtics bring their A game and the Kings bring their A game, the Kings will still lose because Boston has better players. But right. I'm not so sure Boston can play as well as they did last night. They were pretty much flawless last night. I mean, they they were. I don't know if they can play any better than they did last night. Well, and and feel free to to tear down my logic here, but I, I came in this morning. Uh, that that is not what I wanted to see last night. I, I I thought that was about the worst possible thing for the Kings. I did not want to see Boston get their confidence back. I did not want to see Boston win, and I certainly didn't want to see them win by 33, where they could sit their starters in the fourth, which is a big part of a back to back. I thought last night was really bad coming into tonight's game. If you're a Kings fan, do you think I'm off? Yeah, I think you're wrong for this reason because I don't think it's about anyone else other than the Kings, and I think that in order for the Kings to make the playoffs. They're going to have to win a minimum of 13 games. In order to win 13 games, the Kings are going to have to be the team that we saw uh, against Oklahoma City. They're going to have to be the team that we saw, even though it was a loss against Golden State. They're going to have to be the team that, even though it was a loss, was against Milwaukee. They're going to have to play at that level to win 13 games. And in my opinion, the Kings need a win tonight against a good Boston team so that when they hit the road beginning Saturday in New York, they they got that swagger back. They got that confidence back like, hey, you know what? Doesn't matter. We can beat anybody in the league. Uh, I think they need that momentum. So I, I want to see a good Boston team tonight, but I want to see a better Kings team to get that psyche, to get that swagger back before they hit the road on Saturday. Yeah, and you and I have talked about this off air too, and I, I believe you were going over this. I think I heard a little bit of you guys going over the schedule yesterday on your show. Uh, that 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 they need to go now that they've beaten the Knicks. They need to they need to win seven of their next nine. Go seven and two. Um, you you're probably get. I mean, we're we're both guessing. I think we're we're getting Bagley back that first home game Sunday the seventeenth. And again, that's a total guess. So tonight against Boston, uh, you've got March fourteenth. Uh, against Boston next Thursday, 
and then the following day, a back-to-back in Philadelphia. I know you and I were talking about them getting one of those three games, them needing to get one of those three games so they could finish that 10-game stretch going 8-2. and two. Do you think tonight is probably going to be the, the, the most gettable of those three? I, I think so. And I, listen, I, I know that we all have our ways of breaking down the schedule. I, here, here's the way I'm doing it now, because now that we're, we're at the quarter pole, there are 19 games left. The Kings can only lose six of those games. Yeah. So you can you can look at the next four or five. You can look at eight of ten. You can look at whatever you want. I'm just looking at, okay, no matter when they happen, you can only lose six games, and that gets you to 45 wins. And even that may not get you into the playoffs. And and here's something else now, because the Spurs did something I don't think they would do, beating both Oklahoma City and Denver. Yep. One of those one of those 13 wins has to be against San Antonio, yeah. and that's on March 31st. And I told Doug this, and I, I and this. This is like telling Doug the worst thing in the world. If the Kings, and again, big if, if they are still in the race on March 30th when they play at Houston, okay, the night before they play San Antonio, and they're right there, but they have to beat San Antonio, and as much as it pains me to say this, I would rush a lot of the guys against Houston that night. I agree. I agree, and you're right. That is the worst thing you can tell a player. I know, but I'm just saying, and again, I'm not so sure that the Kings will get to that scenario. Now, I'm not conceding anything here because this is exciting and we haven't been in this position in years, okay? So I'm still excited to see if the Kings can win 13 games. But I also think we have to be realistic here. That may not happen. So my second goal right now is to see if this team can go 500, Mm -hmm. all right? To see if they can end up 41 and 41 or better because if they do that with with everything else that's out there, and again, I'm not conceding making the playoffs, but – that would still be an unbelievable, incredible accomplishment for the team this year if they could win half their games. Well, and I want to go back as we're, we're talk to, uh, talking to Grant Napier, the TV voice of your Sacramento Kings, also afternoons with Doug Christie, 3-7 to seven on KHTK. Uh, I want to go back to your point because I think that's a very valid one, and I, don't, I, I know players don't want to hear it. I know fans certainly don't want to hear it. But you're right. Houston has clobbered us all year, and they're peaking. Uh, I'm yeah. with you. I, I, I think maybe at best you go into that Houston game on, on the 30th of March and and if you're not looking good after the first quarter, maybe you put them out there in the first, but you're absolutely right. That's when you're resting the big guns because remember that not only is that San Antonio game insanely important, and that's like you said, if they're still in it, but it's also the second game of a back-to-back. So I agree with you 100%. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And again, if, if you're within, let's say, three games of San Antonio, which would mean you, 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 that game on the 31st, you're, let's just say you're you're three games back. Sure. All right. So you either leave San Antonio four back, which means you're done, yep. or you leave two back. And if you're two back, you still have a chance, even though it's not a great chance, because I think at that point you only have four games left. But hey, you know what? I mean, you you never know. Right. Um, you got to win that game, and your best chance of winning that game is with a fresh team. Again, that's way that's that's. I, I only brought that up because you were talking about the schedule, yep. and I've already looked at all these things. But, uh, I, again, let's see if the Kings can still be with, with – you know, they have a tough schedule coming up. Let's see if they can be in that position at the end of this month. You know, if, if they lose tonight and they lose two of the four road games or three of the four road games, it's not going to matter. It's a moot point. Right. They won't be in it. I mean – the, you, you can only lose six more games the rest of the way. Pick any six you want. doesn't really matter. But that's that's it. You can't lose any more than six and still make the playoffs. Yep, 45, I, I agree with you. 45 is the cutoff. And if you can't get that, like you said, uh, if this team finishes at or above 500, that is a good secondary goal. And we would have all been drug tested back in a September. Yeah, absolutely. No question about it. Grant Napier joining us. Uh, all right, so Bagley's going to be out. Uh, Harry Giles has stepped up quite a bit. And you know me, I get ahead of myself sometimes. I completely admit that. But part of me wa- part of me would love to see what would happen, especially in this stretch where Bagley's out, what, another six games. I wouldn't mind seeing it. I know Jaeger's not going to start Giles. But do you think Giles is ready and deserves grabbing somewhere around 30 minutes here? Has he gotten to that point yet, or do you still think that's a bit dangerous? No, I don't think 30 minutes is a problem as long as he's not in foul trouble. Sure. Uh, I think he's playing well enough. Uh, he still has a tendency to get some of those cheap fouls. And so, but no, I don't think it's unrealistic to say that he could play 30 minutes. I mean, there's he, he's physically able to do it, in my opinion. Uh, his skill set is 
proving that he's effective on, you know, both ends of the floor. You know, a lot would depend on, you know, who is he guarding on the other end of the floor because physically, you know, he is being uh, out-muscled by certain players. Like, you, you don't expect him to be able to go in and guard a Montrez Harrell like he they tried right. to do against the Clippers the other night. Or, you know, I think a lot depends on who the matchup is. But I, I love what I've seen from Harry the last three games. I mean, he's been one of the Kings' best players. Uh, he has been a huge lift off the bench. And, again, that's another reason why I think everyone is so excited about the future of this team. When you look at the core, he's very much part of the core, and he's only going to get better. I mean, look at how much he's improved already this year. He's going to be a fun guy to watch here in the final 19 games. But, yeah, if there's, I don't I don't see, based on, you know, fouls and matchups, I don't see why he couldn't play close to 30 minutes on some nights. We talked in the last segment at length, and I, I've seen you – uh, on social media, talk uh, a bit about LeBron James this year uh, yep. and, and, and some of the stuff he's been going through. And I, I, Grant, I said, listen, LeBron deserves some of the blame. Uh, Luke Walton deserves some of the blame. I, I, I find it real troubling that Magic Johnson seems to be skating through this whole thing, and I think he deserves the most blame out of anyone. Do you, I agree. Do you think he's uh, – put it another way that I think will hit home for you too. I think if Vlade Divac was the GM of the Lakers and made every single move exactly the same that Magic Johnson had made, I think he would have been fired six months ago. Yeah, you're probably right. I think that Magic has a long, long, uh, uh, you know, rope because, let's face it, you know, he is a guy that is one of the greatest Lakers of all time, one of the great people in all of Southern California. I mean, who doesn't love Magic Johnson? Absolutely. I mean, who doesn't love Magic? I mean, you know, even I from Sacramento have affection for Magic, the basketball player and the person, because he was so easy to root for, even though he played on the King's biggest rival. I mean, I, I love Magic Johnson, and, but he's now running a business, and to this point, he's doing it poorly. Now, does he have 100% of the say, or does Rob Polinka have, you know, some of the say, or does Jeannie Buss? I mean, I don't really know when it gets right down to it. Does who has the final say in that organization? Is it Magic? Well, if it's Magic, he's made a lot of bad moves since he took over control, if that's what he has, of that basketball team. So I, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I, I think that a lot of the moves that he's made have been horrible. I personally don't think that Luke Walton should be blamed for any of this. I don't yeah. see how this can fall on Luke Walton at all, but it will, and he'll end up losing his job if that's the way the business works. Um I, I know I speak for you. I love seeing what's going on in L.A. I think it's great. You know, I think it's fabulous. Uh, but it's not going to be fabulous if they get lucky and get Zion Williamson in the draft, you know. Um, uh, but I, I love what I'm seeing. There's no question about it. I swear to God, if the Knicks and Lakers go 1-2 in this draft, I quit. I quit basketball. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm okay if the Knicks go 1 I know because I don't want to see the Zion, Zion Williamson in the uh, West. He has to go somewhere. Sure. Put him in the East. Who cares where he goes in the East? Just to make sure he's not in the West. You might say that for the second best player in this draft, too. And, you know, again, most people say it's a four or five player draft, but I'm okay if the Knicks get the number one pick. Why would Sacramento care about that? I just don't want that whole deal where you feel like it's rigged. And I agree with you. I think the Knicks, the Knicks have been down far longer than the Lakers. And as an NBA fan, I think the Knicks doing well makes the league yeah, better. Yeah, it's not rigged. I mean, if it were rigged, the Lakers and the Knicks would have already had the number one pick in the last several years. When's the last time the Knicks got lucky in the lottery? You know, the Lakers haven't had a number one pick. I mean, I don't think that, you know. Right. That's, I know. It, right. You know what I'm saying? Well, Patrick Ewing? I mean, I'm trying to think, actually. Yeah, last... no, I mean, you've got, you've got to go back all the way to, what was that, 80, 80, what? Three? Four? Four? Three? 83, 84? Yeah, I mean, come on. Hey, you know, sp- so. sp- speaking of New York, what what is... uh? What's your guy Dave Gettleman doing? I don't know what Dave Gettleman's doing. I, I have I have no idea. Um, really disappointed in some of the moves that he's made. I don't understand why you do not tag Landon Collins, who's been a, a twenty. He's twenty five years old and yeah. he's been a Pro Bowler, you know, three out of the last four years, and is considered one of the best defensive players in the game. I, I makes no sense to me now, unless they feel that his injury from last year is going to be a, a chronic thing, which I haven't read that or heard that from anyone. I don't understand why you make that move. That makes no sense to me at all. But, you know, I, I always say I give I give somebody in management three years to show that they know what they're doing or they don't know what they're doing. Again, I'll go back to Vladi Divac for the first two years. He was getting destroyed and ridiculed and criticized by everybody in the country, including here in Sacramento. And, you know, now with that extra year, nobody's criticizing him because he's shown that he can put a team together. So 
So I get Dave Kettleman, I'll give him three years the same way. Grant Napier joining us. Uh, great way to finish off here. Grant, uh, I asked Kyle this question. I'll ask you this question. Is the NBA pledging a fraternity, or are they just trolling their fans with players only at this point? I don't understand your question. Meaning, did they lose a bet? Did the NBA lose a bet? Is there something compelling them to do these players only broadcasts? Oh, oh my God. I'm sorry. I, I okay. When you said players, yeah, it's unwatchable, isn't it? I mean, it's just terrible. It's such a and you know what bothers me the most about these players only broadcasts is, you know, I'm on social media not as much as you because you don't have a life and that's all you do. I'm convinced you're on social media twenty four hours a day. Good point. I'm convinced you wake up every hour on the quarter hour, you know, like, you know, United Airlines going from New York to Chicago to look at Twitter. I do you, have you seen and I really mean this now, I'm not I'm not trying to be funny or I'm not sure have you seen one person that has complimented the players only broadcast and that they really like it? I asked that very question uh, at 7 a.m. at the very end of our segment after we went off on it. Right. And I said, I just want somebody call in. I'll put you right, right. to the top. Nobody called in. Nobody defended nope. it. Well, okay. I did the same thing on social media, and I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of responses, and they were all negative. Okay? I didn't get one positive response. Not only did I not get one positive response, I had responses such as, I haven't heard from one person that likes it. I don't understand. It makes absolutely zero sense. And you can't tell me that the NBA is not hearing the same thing that you and I and others are hearing. I did this. We, Doug and I were on the road somewhere a couple of weeks ago, and I was ripping the players-only broadcast. And I had a caller come in and say that they were listening during our commercial break to a station in K, uh, it was KNBR in San Francisco, and they were talking about the exact same thing. And the guy was blown away. He goes, I can't believe that you're talking about it. During your commercial, I switched over, and they are talking about the same thing and talking about how bad it is. So, so I'll ask you, why is the NBA still doing this? It makes no sense to me. Well, I, I too put out, uh, you and I have different styles on social media, obviously. Um, I put yeah, out. I'm, I'm I'm mature and sound educated and well. I understand the difference. Go ahead. Well, you know, uh, how about this is an example that'll maybe make you change your mind because I put out. <laughs> <laughs> I put out three a uh, few different polls last night okay. and um, okay. I asked people, would you rather watch players only or watch people vomiting on loop? Uh, 75 percent <laughs> said they'd rather watch people vomiting. Um, oh my God. I then said, uh, which would you rather watch, players only or a bunch of dogs humping each other? Uh, oh 81% said they'd rather, easy choice. rather watch dogs humping. Uh, and then finally, uh, which would you rather watch, uh, players only or your legs going into a wood chipper? 62% would rather watch their own legs go into a wood chipper <laughs> than oh watch players only. <laughs> What is wrong with you, dude? Seriously, seriously, what on earth is wrong with you? Um, I'm. What's wrong with me is I'm waiting for you to apologize for calling my social media immature. I just basically <laughs> broke that mold. <laughs> I mean, oh my, oh it's my like, gosh. honestly, yeah. it's, it's like I don't even want to – it's hard for me to even blame the athletes because they're they're just trying to do a job. And a lot of those guys are fine on uh, uh, color commentary. And you and I have talked about this, I think, before. I think Brent Berry, uh, for his, for uh, especially for lack of experience um, – I, I, I watch him do play-by-play, -play and it doesn't make me cringe. I have a lot of respect for that. But why even put these guys in a position to do that, to just embarrass themselves? They're, they're really proving a point how important the play-by-play -play person is yep. to steer the ship. Yep. And if you had just somebody, and you wouldn't even have to do, like, normal play-by-play, -play, but if you just had someone to steer the ship yeah. during the telecast, I believe that it could work. But the fact that they don't have anyone that even knows how to get in and out of commercial breaks, who does, you don't have anyone that even is able to remotely keep the car on the road, it just doesn't work. It's just awful. It's just there. It, it it's almost like the game doesn't matter. And if you have a really good game that's compelling, it makes it really difficult. I have absolutely turned off the games yep. that were good games. I turned off the game in Golden State a couple of weeks ago, I want to believe it was Philadelphia, and it was players only, and I couldn't watch it. It was that bad. It made me actually turn the game off, and I ended up watching another program. I was in a hotel somewhere. I can't even remember where it was. So I, I don't understand it. I think it needs to be looked at, and if they're going to keep the format, 
I believe they need a play-by-play guy. Not to do a conventional play-by-play, right. but to just steer the car just to keep it on the right track. These guys are not able to do that. Speaking on the right track, we're out of time, so I'll leave you with this question. Uh, which would, do you think would be more entertaining to the masses? Uh, players only broadcasts in which the players are doing the entire broadcast, play-by-play, color, sideline, and all that, yep. or an announcer's only game where it was only play-by-play and color analysts that got to actually play the NBA basketball game while the athletes were behind the booth? Oh, I think we already know the answer to that question. I mean, could you imagine a team of me and Jerry Reynolds out on the court with Doug Christie as, you know, our defensive stalwart right. and, you know, may- maybe maybe get a Jim Barnett from the Warriors sure. to join us and, you know, bring in, you know, whomever else, you know. I mean, how great would that be? Are you kidding me? Grant, I think you would dominate Bob Fitzgerald in the post oh, for easily. what it's worth. Easily. Like, that's just easy. Easily. It's easy. It's easy, too. Fitz lately? I don't know if Fitz could run up and down the court, so I think I would definitely dominate him. Yes, think, absolutely. You think Mike Breen would be your outside guy? You think he's got, got a smooth, smooth jumper? Yeah, I think Mike, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, Mike would have, still have his bifocals on, so we'd have to get a strap around his head so they wouldn't fall off. And, yeah, there would, it, would be, it would be an interesting look, you know, don't you? It would re- I agree. Let me think of that concept. Okay. Eh? Let me, maybe I'll throw that to the NBA as an idea in the offseason to explore. Yes, uh, absolutely. Announcers only, hopefully coming soon on pay-per-view. And put wireless mics on us so we could even <laughs> announce the game while we're playing. Okay, now that would be amazing. That's a, I need Mike Breen to pull for three and then bang, I need that. <laughs> No, right, absolutely, I exactly. Need, I need Grant doing a two-handed reverse dunk and going, if you don't like that, I, I need you oh-boying yourself. How high are the baskets that we're playing on? Four feet. Thank you. That's what it would need. <laughs> that's, Come on, dude. That's... I'm going to do a reverse dunk. Come on, what's wrong with you? Uh, you work out. You go to the gym every time I talk to I you. I do work out, but yeah. uh, we don't jump when we work out, okay? That's Grant Napier. You can hear him uh, this afternoon with Doug Christie at 3 p.m. And on the call tonight, on the your television, uh, pregame 6.30 tip-off at 7. Have a great call, buddy. Have a great show, and thanks, thanks as always. Yep, take, take care. care. All right. <laughs> You're listening to The Drive.